So we are in Broken Science and Diversity is the name of the game. And I would love it if you added uh, your name on the roll call, which many anonymous tigers, pandas, anteaters are already doing. And uh, I'm going to set the scene. I hope very much I purposefully didn't make slides. And then as I was reflecting a little bit more, um, I sort of realized that the title didn't make any sense unless you happen to have already read a paper that myself and Olivia Guest wrote um, a little while ago, but it was published this year. So this setting the scene, I'm actually, I hope it's not going to be too, too boring. I'm actually going to just read it. So as a jock with a retort to one of the few cases of strange and aggressive, one of a few cases of strange and aggressive behavior from some open science people towards others online, one of us, it was Olivia. <laughs> all of the puns in this paper are all Olivia and they are fantastic. Coined the expression broken science in a June 2017 tweet. This was after a discussion with other women within the open science movement who had noticed this phenomenon, but were looking for a concise description. Now, very importantly, broken science is tongue in cheek, um, but it also has a serious side, shedding light on the narrow demographics and off-putting behavioral patterns seen in open science. The phrase is necessarily rhetorical to draw attention to an issue that's been systematically underappreciated. And we know that it does evoke a visceral reaction. That's kind of the point. That was why it was created in the first place. And labeling problems allows us to tackle them. So, I'll say that, that one of the hardest parts of writing this paper from my perspective was defining a bro. It was so hard for me because everything that I did, I was like, no, it's not, it's not that, but it's not that. And sort of everything that I wrote was really set up to kind of be, be picked at and be like, hashtag not all um, bros. And so this section, this is why I wanted to kind of copy and paste it in there. It's really important that, not all, that we recognize that not all men are bros and not all bros are men. And it's also not just about gender. There are so many different um, overlapping, intersecting systems of oppression that the, the bro sort of personality, the bro kind of um, uh, behaviors, they're not related to gender, even though obviously that's where the sort of name comes from. So with great, great appreciation to my many amazing friends, some of whom are, are here um, for these long conversations that I had with them about like, what do I mean when I say, bro, help me, help me. Um, we came up with this one within the open science movement A bro will often be condescending, forthright, aggressive, overpowering, and lacking kindness and self-awareness. Although they solicit debate on important issues, they tend to resist descriptions of the complexities, nuances, and multiple perspectives on their argument. They often veer into antisocial patterns of dialogue, such as sea lining, which is the act of intruding on and trying to derail a conversation with disingenuous questions. You've interacted, this is my favorite part actually, you've interacted with a bro if you've ever had the feeling that what they're saying makes sense superficially, but would be hard to implement in your own research practices. In general, bros find it hard to understand or accept that others will have a different lived experience to themselves. And so at its worst, broken science actually builds like another closed system. It's, it's uh, there may be little more sharing within a select in-group who have the skills and resources to engage with new initiatives. It doesn't actually reach out and open science up to those who historically have had little or no access to it. It creates new breaks within science, such as excluding people from participating in open science uh, due to the behavior of a vocal, powerful, and privileged minority. It's a type of exclusionary, monolithic, inflexible rhetoric that ignores or even builds on structural power imbalances. And it can be brittle and it can chastise people who don't follow solutions to the letter. So the rest of the paper digs into more of that and we finish on a much more sort of positive and right, you know, tone where we recommend lots of different, um, different actions that people can take to sort of ensure that, you know, they are my, minimizing their bro-ishness. Um, I think there's a line in there somewhere that we're all a little bro-y sometimes and, uh, and maximizing kind of that intersectionality. And I left this in here. I want to just sort of shout out Olivia, who was the most sort of beautifully inspiring co-author I've ever worked with. Um, 
with what's very cool is that although she and I agree on very, very many things, um, when we are, like I say here, driven by frustration at the inefficiency of the current research practices, we, our work and philosophies are different and we do see the world in a different way. And importantly, that's a feature and it's not a bug. Um, a diverse and inclusive definition of open science, and you can reflect, you can replace that as open scholarship, open infrastructure, open access is necessary to truly reform academic practice. So that's a little pricey to the paper. You can go ahead and read the rest of it, but I don't want to, I, don't, I could read you the whole paper. That would be our whole breakout room. How boring is that? But I want to just take a minute before we kind of jump into the discussion to ask you to please complete um, these three uh, little fill-in spaces. What do I want you to do? I'd like you to write into the, write into the Google Doc. Who inspired you to start on your open journey? And I, I purposefully said, you know, I didn't put infrastructure in there. It doesn't have to be infrastructure. Put in, oh my God, that's adorable. <laughs> uh, who inspired you to start on your open journey? I'm very, very curious if you feel comfortable sharing what barriers you've experienced. And please add here uh, what questions you would like to cover in this session. There's lots and lots of people in this room who are very, very expert in lots of different um, elements of the many things that we touch on in that paper. I know a lot of you think about diversity an awful lot. So I'm just going to set a five minute timer. I'm just going to ask you to please um, write down your answers and then please also put a little plus one uh, underneath or next to ideas that you, you agree with. Um, and we will come back to discussing all together.
I have to say I, I do actually kind of love when there are these like exciting typo clashes of people writing the same, on the same line. I, I know it's a little frustrating sometimes, but thank you very much for, for kind of engaging. I just want to encourage you to spend a couple of minutes um, putting some suggestions of what questions you would like to address in this section, uh, in this session, sorry, in this last section, so that we can then sort of make sure to hit some of the key points that, that you're all interested in. I'm going to get, I'm going to let all these colors on this one line sort of resolve their various different lines together. And, uh, and then I'll come back to this section. So I'm just going to scroll up. I'm not, I'm not going to share my screen the whole way through, but um, these are really beautiful answers. I mean, this is just the coolest thing. This is the coolest thing to see all of these different names. I recognize a lot of these people. I recognize, um, you know, what I've learned from a lot of these different people as well. So it's beautiful to be able to sort of see the power of having someone call you in and, and bring you along with them on this journey. Um, I think there's a lot of plus ones in, a, in the um, barriers um, and healthy competition, uh, supervisors that don't see the, the value. This is, this is quite a sad one, but very, very, very true. Combining the, the work in open source with work that leads to a sustainable and enjoyable career in academia um, lack of institutional support, um, sustainable funding, um, ageism is a really, really important one there. Um, some upskilling, um, resistance from faculty, resistance from people inside of the lab. I like this plus infinity over here. Um, conflict between what to want to personally do over being this new scary thing. And what I guess I want to sort of highlight is it, I don't know how explicit uh, some of the points are down here as they're, as they're emerging is I'd, I'd be curious to have us sort of dig into and think about how these barriers intersect with um, diversity and inclusion. I, I think there's, there's probably underlying um, causes for a lot of these barriers that are shared between um, a sort of a, a biased culture that has that oppresses um, traditionally underrepresented groups, and also makes it very difficult for us to take forward some of our goals for open research, open science, open scholarship, open um, infrastructure. So, in terms of questions to address. Um, we're thinking about how to ensure equity, diversity, and inclusion in open science policies and infrastructures how to embed diversity concerns at a time when budgets are under threat and institutions are becoming more conservative. I think that's, that's a really, really important one. Where to obtain expertise in designing DEI policies. Um, this one is, is quite long, but this one is like a statistics one. So like a validity of the research um, often requires a certain kind of amount of data, for example, or a certain type of um, computational understanding. And I think that's probably a really important one for us to, for us to dig through. Um, thinking about a um, retaliation, uh, especially if known people against those involved in trying to hold them accountable without following. So whether you are both famous <laughs> or not famous and uh, trying to stand up and do something good. How can open science and um, 
Jedi in Istu. So the J, I, I'm assuming there is justice, which is a really important element of like, why would you do equality, diversity, and inclusion work? It's for social justice. Um, how to make inclusion values central to open science conversations. So this is, you know, this is a really, this is one that I'm very, very keen for us to, to discuss. And maybe you can all talk with me in the Slack channel about that uh, going forward. Discussions on the methods for removing barriers. How to balance time invested in making everything open and inclusive and being productive in current academic settings. Now that productive has italics underneath it. And that's, that word productive is carrying a lot of cultural and incentive sort of capitalist baggage with it. So it's an important one for us to dig into. Um, how to make sure that we effectively bring those outside of academia in and how to identify the best channels for surveying and learning user stories. Now, um, there are so, so many different um, points on here. And my, my clock says, I think we have 35 minutes left. Is that right, Caitlin? Or is it less than that? Uh, 35 minutes is correct. We go to the top of the hour. We go to the top of the hour. Great. So I would like my first question to all of you, I'm going to stop sharing. I would like my first question to all of you to say, how will we make this decision? How are we going to choose which of these points we're going to spend time on? And that's not a rhetorical question, just to be clear. I am looking for um, blue hands up in the um, Zoom. I'm looking for someone to put forward a suggestion. Katie, hi, thank you so much. Katie, would you like to suggest a, a plan? Yeah, I was just going to say that maybe maybe it's a good idea to start with the ones that have gotten a lot of plus ones, um, just because it seems like, well, and there's some plus twos and plus infinities, I guess, so maybe that's hard to compare, but um, that's just one way to think about it, I guess. I think that sounds, I think that sounds good. Would anyway, <laughs> let's, for counting purposes, count a plus two as a plus one, count a plus infinity as a plus one. Then we're going into a binary system here, um, but yes. So I think that's I think that sounds good. Would anyone like to offer any other uh, other suggestion? I'm going to assume that if you don't speak, we will go with Katie's suggestion. Not speak, but like raise your hand. Okay, so we're going to go with we're going to go with that one. Now, I am like pretty anti voting, not in democratic elections on a national level. I'm very into voting on an um, election level. But I think there's an interesting risk of um, having a majority speak. What I hope, though, is the case that in giving you a little bit more time, you have not all had to put your hand up, speak on a Zoom call, sort of stick your neck above the parapet just a little ways. And as a result, we may have a slightly more equitable um, distribution of our plus ones. I'll just note as well that that process also requires us to have good actors, right? Like we are trusting in this system that we don't have people who are just adding lots and lots and lots of plus ones. And I think that is another super, super interesting thread, which I don't think anyone wrote down. So we're not going to go into a whole... Um, Bitcoin blockchain for um, open infrastructure discussion just yet. That can maybe be a breakout in the Slack discussion. So let me come across. I'll share my screen so you can sort of see me, um, see me working. So does anyone does anyone know which ones have the largest pluses? I see a few with three. So let's go with. Um, I'm just going to prioritize them um 
So I've not deleted it, don't worry. I'm just pulling it up here. Great. And there's another one with three, which was here. So let's go for, um, let's go for, I'm going to go for sort of seven minutes for each of these top three. That should give us a little bit of time just at the very end to, um, to dig into them. So the first one is how do we ensure equity, diversity and inclusion in open science policies are embedded inside of those policies and infrastructures? So I'll stop sharing. And again, now, would anyone like to offer their suggestions on either to expand on the question, to expand on problems or to offer suggestions and solutions? Um, Inna, I hope I am sure I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, but if you'd like to unmute, let me know. Thanks. It's, it's almost correctly Irina. Uh, Irina. And, uh, Irina. Yeah. My organization works in uh, Africa, Asia and Europe. So that's geographies we, we're coming from. Uh, and um, the theme was uh, this year's Open Access Week theme and uh, what we did together with uh, Confederation of Open Access Repositories and Open Air Project. In Europe, we hosted a series of discussions around uh, open science policies, which uh, we thought already include these elements. And it was a national uh, open science policy in France. Uh, uh, then we had a speaker from China about new research assessment reform, a um, uh, speaker from Montenegro, where they specifically said that they, they wouldn't bother with uh, journal impact factors when they evaluate researches and also included open infrastructures and uh, other topics in that policy. And uh, there were also discussions in Latin America about reforming research assessments. Uh, and uh, we had a speaker from India who is involved in uh, national science, technology and innovation policy that addresses these issues. And these were all the examples we could identify and angles that we took. And I was wondering whether, whether we're missing something, what could be added, what other policies uh, you know that include equity, diversity uh, as part of the language. And uh, we, we want to have a database of those policies for others who would like to follow this example. Thanks. That sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing that work and thank you for um, sharing that work. That's wonderful. Would anyone else like to build on or add in another point? Caitlin, yeah. Oh, shoot. Just so you know, I've got you all in. Uh, right. I've got you. Now I've got you in where I can see more of you. There's not very many. <laughs> though, so I'm mostly the little blue hands. So you raise your hand. But Caitlin, okay. come on in. Gotcha. Um, so on our end, you know, and for Invest in Open Infrastructure, we're talking about funding and sustainability. And I know some members of this group have been um, part of these conversations. You know, we had a, a pretty frank discussion and I, I started in March of, you know, the fact that being intentional about who's not part of these conversations um, and taking it beyond, you know, sort of an equity and inclusion statement to understanding that especially for the work that we're doing. We're not only talking about the systemic issues that exist in open source, that also exist in higher ed, that also exist when you talk about capitalism and funding and being a sustainability focused organization, there is a real risk that the work and the recommendations and the things that we do could further lock in some of those inequities and uh, make it further in, in, inaccessible. And so we um, have been working with um, uh, some inclusion consultants to actually say, listen, we need to actually build an anti-racist um, frame for what we do. And for those that aren't familiar with that term, to me, that kind of takes it from less of a statement to more of this is the tactics to dismantle um, some of this and to think through not only representation in our governance, um, given that we had sort of a coalition prior to me joining of individuals who were working to build up IOI and thinking about what decision making intentionally looks like but also what that means for the ways in which we operate through every dimension of our work, um, which is tough, very, very tough work, but necessary in my view, because if we're not going to do it, then who is? I think that's really wonderful. I think what I would pull out from that is the importance of 
it's the sort of it's actually the next point in the discussion the 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 intersections of all of these uh, processes and i i also want to sort of highlight the word so the word open oh my god the word open means like a million different things it means different things to different people we could do a whole breakout room on it but i think the word sustainable and the word infrastructure as well so it's in the title <laughs> there's a whole bunch of stuff going on but i think sustainability is also probably our next I think that's our next big ally as open advocates to kind of um, really work with. I think there's been a really great sort of increase of appreciation in the last couple of years, a few more than that, of the importance of inclusion, equity, inclusion, and justice in open. And I think we're, you know, the fact that we're having these conversations and it's not the first one. And we wrote this paper a year ago and actually everyone sort of already knows a bunch of this stuff already um, is really good. I think we're moving things forwards. I do think that the sustainability, so thinking about climate sustainability and thinking about climate justice, I think it's a really beautiful idea to try and bring all of those things in together because the other angle that sits in investing in open infrastructure is actually what um, Timnit's paper was talking about, which is the environmental impact of huge machine learning models. That's a particular type of infrastructure. And I do think it's a really, yeah, I think it's really important um, network to, for us to kind of curate. Before we move on to thinking about uh, the second point, which was how do we, uh, how can open science and uh, JEDI initiatives support each other? I want to just see if um, anyone else has thoughts about ensuring that EDI sits inside of open science policies beyond um, building on ones that already exist and learning from each other. So I think there's an interoperability. We should probably take some data standards and data management into our policies. But does anyone else have anything that they want to add? I guess I might just say um, involving undergraduates and younger um, students as much as possible. Um, if you're thinking about like pipeline problems of diversity, they tend to get worse as people advance in their careers. So, um, you know, talking with with younger researchers and younger students can you can kind of broaden your base a little bit. Um, and then also, the, I've I've seen. So I, I work at UC Berkeley, and and maybe Berkeley is a particularly politically active campus, but a lot of universities are like this. And um, you know, they the the younger students are willing to kind of like stand up and yell for things that they that they want. Um, so an another way is to is to work with younger people to kind of help them raise their voices for for these kinds of things that they are interested in. Yeah. So I have a question for folks, and um, maybe we'll. It'd be interesting to hear. You can add. Um, there's a section in the chat as well. You're welcome to add notes and. Links in the chat for it, so we'll keep it for posterity beyond the, the um, Zoom chat. I have a question around um, are the people setting EDI policies, JEDI policies, in your institutions the same people who are setting open science, open scholarship, open access uh, policies? So there's a really, I think there's a really simple one, unless everyone tells me that they're all like, it's all the same people and everyone's super connected. I've never worked in an organization where that's the case. And so I feel like there's also an importance around connecting up to the people who are writing them, as well as um, making sure that we engage people on the dimensions that they're most, they're most um, interested, motivated. Chris, would you like to um, unmute? Uh, yeah, this is my internet is functional here. Um, I guess like, so I, one extra quick thought I had on policies is kind of coming at it from the opposite direction. Um, like we can sort of think in terms of proactively, what are policies that that we can set to improve DEI and whatnot. But something that I've noticed at least at, at Berkeley over the years is that there are a lot of policies that end up having like the reverse effect. They're not explicitly about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but they often in practice make it much harder to, to bring in a more diverse coalition into your projects or, or whatever. An example of this that I've always run into is in many universities, like the turnaround time for hiring people or for hiring contractors is like on the order of seven to eight months. And in practice, what I found is that that biases those jobs towards people that can effectively be able to be in limbo for seven to eight months where they don't know exactly what their next job is going to be. 
And it made me think that there may be other kinds of things to look at in terms of ways to improve university um, operations that may not explicitly be about, you know, whatever, like demographics and things like that, but they probably do have pretty big downstream effects in terms of our ability to bring in different kinds of people um, into these spaces. Let me, my, my timer went off whilst Chris was talking, which is the timer to take us on to the second bullet point, which is how can open science and EDI initiatives support each other? And I actually think that your comment was a really good bridge for that, of this sort of, at the moment, they, they maybe don't always support each other um, and they sometimes pull in different directions. So I'm just curious to know if anyone has thoughts on how, what, what nudges, what changes do we need to have these initiatives work together? So just as a reminder, just in case anyone's over here, I can't see very many faces because most people have their videos off, which is totally fine. But the blue hand is really good for <laughs> being able to uh, tell me that you want to join in. Sorry, just as a reminder of, of the question and uh, um, because I had to jump out for a second, but how to balance time invested in making everything open or how can no, oh, we right, the initiative? The one before, yeah, yeah, the one before that. So the one saying, how do we have these, um, how do we have initiatives for equity and inclusion and open science support each other? And and I I, I guess I want to invite people if you don't think they can support each other it's okay to not answer the question you can sort of continue in in chris's chris's vein of, of noting where these problems are so i personally think that they're really um intertwined but i think people have difficulties trying to um, yeah, find other initiatives that are actually trying to achieve the same thing that they are doing if they're not aware of each other. So I guess reaching out and, and improving communication strategies and I guess maybe defining your goals better so that we can align those goals. I guess that's all very abstract. It's like nice to have like an abstract goal of defining your goals a bit more. Um, yeah, we have a new a new starter who just started working with me last week and her objective for the first three months is to define her job. So her objective is to define her objectives. Um, yeah, yeah. So communication. I'm curious. I'm looking at the sort of folks in the room. I think there are definitely people here who do not think that having more conversations is the way to go. But maybe I'll ask you to, not, not you Esther, sorry, but thank you for, for speaking. I'll ask people in the room to suggest speaking with whom, like who are the people that need to be, that need to be in these conversations. Rosie, hi, yeah, go for it. So maybe this is obviously not a devil's advocate point, but I'll maybe say something that might not be popular, which is I'm not sure all of our institutions are super committed to the equality and diversity and inclusion agenda. So I'm not sure that speaking to people in HR who 
might have um, some responsibility for this within their jobs, but don't particularly actually want it, or it's been pushed on someone because they're the only person who ticks some box within that institution is actually going to help us take this forward. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure what the solution is to that, but I just uh, thinking about the idea of putting lots of energy into working with those people if they don't actually want to do it is quite um, alienating. I think that's a really good point. Um, Rachel, please join in. Yeah, I was just going to say at the same time, you also don't want to um, add even more burden to the people who are already oppressed. So these sorts of things need to be tackled by those of us um, with the privilege to actually kind of make those changes or at least try and, and try and drive those changes within our own communities. I think that's I think that's a really that's a really good point of like the question is who's gonna do it? I'm gonna do it. Like someone's gonna do it, someone has to do it. And then I think you hit a really, a really, really important sort of equilibrium point of how much capacity does an individual person have to give for the thing that affects them personally the most. Um, it will be the most compelling to wheel out the one black female professor that you have and have her speak. But she's going to be she's going to be rolled out and asked to do that over and over again. And she's going to have all of these other structural barriers for completing her research um, or completing her job within the um, administration team or completing her job within the library or whatever role um, that this member of a sort of underrepresented group has. And so make it the, there's a sort of balance between the individual and the kind of institutional and structural, the, the who are the institutions, who actually, there is no actual institution without the people that are inside of it, but those individual people, I think, all feel like they have very little power um, to make this change. Would anyone else like to continue this, this point, the one that we um, nominated around, oh, sort of lost it in the chat now, because there's all this interesting stuff going on. I can't read and talk at the same time. How can open science and EDI initiatives support each other? Chris, go for it. Okay, so I actually have a question for everybody and I'm curious if anyone can provide um, suggestions. But for me, like I, I was trying to come up with an answer to this question. And to me, the answer in a sort of generic sense is to try to find people that are in positions of leverage to be able to sort of enact change institutionally. And I realize that I don't know exactly who those people are. And obviously it totally depends on the context. And I wonder, you know, if anyone has references or suggestions for understanding how ideas propagate throughout organizations via like hierarchical organizations, for example, via like trajectories of influence and power. To me, it seems like influence and power are like a big factor in these kinds of issues. And answering that question of like, who's the person that needs to hear about this requires having like, a strategy and a model for how you're going to use the institutional power mechanisms to like affect that very institution. And I'm curious what people will think about that or if they have suggestions. Uh, Samantha, please go ahead. Um, following up on Chris's point, because um, we know each other from Berkeley, so I can understand maybe what he's getting at. Um, I think one of the things that I try to do when I'm, I teach open science methods and workflows to graduate students is to demystify the workflows, but in doing that, kind of demystify the setting they find themselves in. And I think when you're showing people the tools of open science, you're sort of uh, getting at the kind of nuts and bolts of those, those pieces, but hopefully you're also um, providing some transparency around the environment that they're in. And to me, that gets at providing a welcoming, inclusive space for new graduate students who are likely to stay in their fields and succeed beyond. So I think the two can go together where you're getting at the actual workflows and the pieces people need to do the day-to-day the -day work, and then hopefully uncovering the weird systems and relationships and hierarchies that they need to navigate as part of that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking at the time, there's tons and tons of, there's loads more things that we could say about this, but I want to get to the third point, which was how to balance time invested in making everything open and inclusive and being productive in current academic settings, and in particular, 
as an early career researcher. Um, so Samantha, I'm going to put your hand down just so I don't get confused. But if you want to like raise it back up again, um, please do. So who has thoughts on how to balance time invested in openness, in inclusivity, and also this, this heavy, heavy word of productivity? Irina, good for it. We talked about uh, encouraging students at citizen science workshops that uh, we had last year. And um, the best recipe we could come up with was to give credits to students. So if, if this is something that uh, they will be rewarded for, are the additional points uh, in, um, within their assignments or like really additional credits if they attend an open science course that seem to be works the best in European universities. And can I just ask you to clarify when you say credits, do you mean like university credits, like things that will appear on their transcript or are you talking more generally about giving them credit, the many different definitions of credit? Oh, I, I meant university credits. So in Europe we have this EST credits system here. Yeah, like, I wouldn't even tell what it, what it stands for, but these are like points students get when uh, they uh, finish the course. This was, and thank you so much. Does anyone else want to join in? For anyone on the call, maybe there's another version of this. There's three elements inside of this question. There's, there's open, inclusive, and productive. Which ones do you feel that you've, you've not done? You know, there's that sort of rule of like, you can do two of these things well, but you can't do the third. Who, who is willing, is anyone willing to share the thing that they think they've dropped in there? I don't know, maybe not their whole career. That seems too long a time scale. But what, would, what do you think is the thing that's gone? Escape it. Sorry, I feel like I'm talking a lot. Um, I so, so just from a personal standpoint, I think that for me, getting at this question was a matter of understanding that like productivity is something that is defined in part by external entities and in part by myself. And answering this question was partially one of redefining what for myself was productivity and success, um, and trying to be realistic about how that definition fed into different kinds of pathways that like may or may not be in front of me. So I think one thing is to be really honest about like what it is that you want to achieve and think hard about that and and to sort of like recognize that 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 will have implications about like what you define as productive and decide if that's okay with you or not. I think that's really great. Does anyone else have anything that they've any balance that they've struck? Um, Dario here. Uh, sorry, I hope it's okay. That I, I don't turn on my camera for now. Um, yeah, I just want to say, like, uh, to me, like, there's a big fundamental question behind that notion of productive, especially in academic settings, because uh, we all know that productive in academic settings means publishing, right? <laughs> and um, and and so the the confound behind the question to me is really boils down to how other activities are evaluated and valued and contribute to someone's career progression. Um, spending time in creating documentation for a tool or a data set um, that many others may reuse precisely to bridge um, access to knowledge in, in, in science on, on, or scholarly research um, is something that uh, doesn't contribute to someone's productivity by the definition of what counts in academia. So I'm just uh, preaching to the choir here, but I think the underlying um, so confound for productivity really is um, 
what we value as uh, as academic outputs. Yeah, I think that's I think that's exactly right. Would anyone else like to join in? Yeah, Katie, go for it. Yeah, I think um, I've kind of been thinking about like how to how to embed both open and, and inclusion values in, in things like career advancement and, and tenure decisions and that kind of thing. And um, I've seen a couple of um, like opinion pieces, blog type type of editorial things where people are talking about um, having at least one person on a tenure committee, uh, you know, considering things like. Uh, how are researchers uh, interacting with the local communities that they are collecting data from and that kind of thing. So it, the how inclusion and openness manifests, it, manifests itself is different depending on the research setting. But, um, you know, trying to get those, the people who make those decisions to include that as part of their criteria for um, evaluating someone's productivity um, is, is one way to think about it. That's how that's actually how you convince people to do that is is another question um, that could be a goal. I think it loops it loops in with some of the other discussions that we've had of like you know what's the what's the personal responsibility what's the personal kind of assessments for what good looks like what success looks like and then who can be who can who can we communicate that to? I'm going to use um, the last couple of minutes to share out um, one thing that. I have sort of taken on and taken to heart very, very strongly, and I don't know if others will find it um, valuable. So one is that my pathway to open, like one of the reasons that I got involved in um, open science in the first place is because I was profoundly capable of finding null results in my PhD, and I could not for the life of me find results that were in the published literature. And so I got really, my sort of inroad was the the file draw effect this sort of gap in the publication um in the literature of result you know results that people worked on they probably worked on for many years but they didn't actually publish and so I turned up I'm this new grad student and I just think well no one's published in this area how interesting let me go ahead and spend five years of my life attempting to um now I think though that gap is also one of the hugest problems that we have from a diversity and inclusion standpoint. So when people leave because of a toxic environment, we are left with a system that is built by the people. It's like the ultimate survivor bias. So the system, the the system, the university, the university is made up of people, but importantly, the decision makers are the people for whom the system has worked very well. So what I want to say to any of the early career researchers, this is like my biggest piece of advice that I give to absolutely anyone, is that if you find joy in staying in academia and a really good day in science is a really, really good day, if you find joy staying in your career, you should stay. And that's the thing that is going to make the biggest difference because having you succeed, having you progress, so long as you don't sort of violate your own personal values in doing so, you will be the change. You will be the the thing that people look at and say, look, it can be done. And I want to sort of also, I put it in the Google Doc. There is a book called Emergent Strategy, which is sort of my like go-to kind of book for when I'm struggling to know where I'm supposed to go. And there are lots of different principles. And I I think of the principles very often, but the very first one is that um, small is small is all um and the large is a reflection of the small and so if you embody your values that's the only way to then cascade that out to an institutional level so that's really a that's really a message for the early career researchers and the people who feel that they have the least amount of power in the system and i think the more that we can do to support them uh, with a lot of the concrete ideas that we we also shared um the better We've just got two minutes. I'm going to share my screen one more time and ask you to um, sling your little way back to um, the Google Doc. I'd be very, very grateful if you would add in uh, something that worked in this section. Come on, there's got to be something. Uh, Something that didn't work. Anything that you would change for a 50-minute discussion on this topic. I get asked to do them a lot, so I'm very curious and very keen to hear your thoughts. And anything that surprised you. That's always just kind of a bit exciting to, to see what what surprised you? 
think our breakout room is going to close um, any any second now. Um, and so look at that. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the discussion. Thank you for all of the comments um, in the Google Doc. And please keep the discussion coming um, on Slack. I'm happy to direct message with anyone who's not confident um, posting in a public channel. Oh, not a problem.